let's get started then. So our first feature we're going to look at tonight is containers. So as the name implies, containers are objects that can contain other objects. This is useful for creating activities that rely on objects being recognized and either accepted or rejected by another object. Any object that does not match the chosen properties is rejected whenever somebody attempts to pull it into that container. So there are three container options that are available for, for objects. So I can set my container to contain anything, to contain only objects with certain keywords, or to contain specific objects. And we're going to have a little look at all three of these. So the easiest one to do is um, anything. So that's the first one we're going to look at. So what I need to do first of all is just go over here and I'm going to pin my page browser onto the side. Now, as you'll notice, I'm using the um, Active Inspire Studio skin. If you are a, a primary user, you might be more familiar with the primary skin, um, which is the, the blue and yellow interface, a lot more chunky icons for younger learners. Everything that I'm showing you tonight, you can do exactly the same in both interfaces. Just Things just might slightly be in a different location for you, but your browser window um, will open up at the side, just as mine is, whether it's the left side or the right side, and you can pin it in place too. And all, the browser that we're looking for is the property browser. So when I hover over top of it, I get the tool tip to tell me what that is, the property browser. Okay. If, if you've closed your browser down by accident, you just go to view and click on that browser and that will show it again. Okay. So let's get on to our containers with anything. So as I said, the easiest one to do is anything. So what I want to do is firstly select the object that I want to become the container. And in here, now you'll see that my um, properties options have changed because I now have an object selected. And I want to go to this one here that says container. And next to can contain, I want to select anything. Now, I'm not going to bother changing anything else for this. I just wanted to keep this container nice and simple so that anything I put on top of it will automatically be contained. So now I can drag over text, images. I can drag over a sound file, um, shapes. Okay. Lots of different things that I can drag on there. And once they're on top of that, because that container said to contain anything, I can then pick them up and move them around. The biggest, one of the, one of the biggest rules with containers is you need to make sure that your container is on a layer that's lower than what you want it to contain. Okay, so if I tried to contain this one, it wouldn't work because I put this text on before I put the image of the sticky note. Okay? And that's our first container created. Now, what I what I like with this sticky note, and this is a little aside, and I always like to give it a little a little bit extra in these sessions besides the features I've said I'm going to cover, is we could do a really good brainstorming session with our class. So maybe we were doing something on the seasons, and I wanted my class to give me some ideas of words um, that they would associate with the different seasons. So we brainstormed that. And then we put all of those words onto our little sticky note here that we can pick up and move around. And if I open up my page browser, uh, I'm just going to go down to the next page here. I can drag that sticky note onto the next page in my flip chart. So now when I click on that page, you'll see I have that sticky note with all of the words on it. So I've got my container with all of those words that we wrote. And I can now pick those words off and place them where on the picture they would go. So in this case, which season would they be associated with? Okay. So again, if I, if I pick it up, you can see that the words that are still contained move with the container, but the words that I pull off are no longer contained and they'll stay on that flip chart page. Okay, so that's our first container and that's contain anything. The second contain option is using keywords. And I have to say this is one of my favorite options that I like to use when creating containers. So to create a container using keywords, the first thing that you need to do is anything I want to be contained, 
I need to assign a specific keyword to them. So we're looking at odd and even. So I've got dominoes. I want them to add the dots together and then decide whether it's an odd number or an even number. So I need to select the objects I want to contain. So I'm going to select my first one here and go to my object browser. Now this time I want to go to identification at the top and I want to assign it a keyword. So I'm going to go in and assign it a keyword. And I can see that that's going to be an even number. So I'm going to add and just type in even and click OK. And that's, and that's all I need to do for that for, to, to get my keyword. What I could also do is down here where it says return if not contained, you want to make sure that you put true. So that if it isn't correct, if they don't drag it onto the correct container, it bounces back. The next one is, I can choose another one. So this one I'm going to choose, um, we know that this is going to be an, even, an odd number. So I'm going to go up here again to my identification. And the little dot, 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 I want to add in, and I'm going to add odd in there and click OK. And down here at container, I want to make sure I say return if not contained, false. Okay, so I could do that one at a time for all of those, but what I could also do is save a lot of time by changing the properties of multiple objects. So this time I'm going to select all of the odd numbers. So you can see I'm just selecting all of the ones that are going to turn out to be odd. I think that's it. And this time I want to go up to my identification and I'm going to add and we'll say odd in there. So I can change them all at the same time. And down at containers, I want to make sure return if not contained true. And then I can do the same for all of my even ones. Okay, so I'm going to change them all at the same time to identification, dot, 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 add, oh, it helps if I spell it right, even, and then down to my container down here. Okay. So now all of these will either have odd or even as one of their keywords in there, okay? So what I now need to do is I need to tell what objects I want to be the containers. So to do that, I just select the object. So this is going to be my first container. And I want to go down to containers there. And this time I want it to contain a keyword. And next to contain words, the word that we're looking for is odd and click OK. Now, the other thing that I could do is I could set a reward sound on that if I wanted. So if I said true and then this becomes available, go to my little dot, 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 and it takes me to my sound. So I'm just going to choose the applause for this one. OK, now I need to do that same for my next container. So let's just change that one to keywords as well, and dot, 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 add, and we want to make this one even. Okay, and again, I'm going to add a little reward sound into there, and this time I'm going to have a cheering sound. Okay, so now it should all be set up for me so that I can see that this is an even number. If I drag it to an odd box, it bounces back, and if I drag it to even, it stays and it plays that little reward sound for me. Okay, so an odd number bounces back, put it in the right container, and it plays that sound. Now I can see chat popping up, and I know that I've got my helpers on there who, who are answering some questions, but just to let everybody know, we are recording this session, and we, mil we will make um, the recording available to you afterwards as well, okay? I know that I am going quite quickly, um, but with these sessions, it's information provided for you. If you want to, to watch the video back again afterwards and follow it to learn how to do what I'm showing, that's when you can really slow it down um, to, to do it step by step, okay? So as I say, it is being recorded and you will have access to the recording afterwards. Okay, so that's our, our keyword container. And just an example of that, there's some great content on Promethean um, Planet where um, 
these where people have used these features. And this is one that I, I quite like that I found just to show you a different way. So in the last example, I was using um, images of dominoes, or I could use I could use numbers or shapes or various other things for sorting. In this case, they wanted to sort sentences into true or false boxes. So here, when we read it, even predators can be food for other animals. If I were to say false and put it in my box, it bounces back. And if I put it under true, we can see it stays there and it has a nice little sound that plays. Okay? So that's just an example of that of being used. Now the last type of contain option that we have available is specific object. Okay, so as I said, the easiest one is can, can contain anything. But that doesn't help me if I want to be able to show a right or wrong to my class. So keywords is really good at doing that, being able to say, if it has this keyword, it goes in this box. If it has this keyword, it goes in this box. And I can do lots of different ones as well, as long as, as I have um, you know, different keywords that I'm using for each of the containers. The last one is really if you have one answer and you want it to be contained. So for example, here, I've got three famous artists and I want to know, we've been studying them, and I want to know if my class can remember which artist is which. So what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to select the first box, okay? Now, I know that this is Monet. So I'm going to go again to that container option there and I want it to contain a specific object. So when I've now selected that, the field underneath, this one here, contain object becomes available. And I want to click the little dot, dot, dot there. And what I get then is the, I can select the object. So what's really nice is I get a little vid visual image of that. So I actually want the text and I'm looking for Monet. So I found Monet there and I'm going to click OK. And then what I, I'm not going to change anything else this time. I'm just going to leave it as it is without a reward sound. But what I do need to do is select Monet and make sure that I say that I want it to be returned if not contained. Okay, so return if not contained. So now I've got my other one set up. So this one specific object, we can see text three. So text three is Van Gogh. So that's the right name. And again, with Van Gogh, I just want to make sure return if not contained. And we've got, so you can see I have to do that with each of them. So I want to do return if not contained here. Okay, so now if I drag Monet onto the wrong one, it bounces back. But if I drag Monet onto the right one, it stays where it should go. Same with Van Gogh. Oh, Van Gogh didn't behave. Van Gogh shouldn't have gone there. Um, that one should be. Picasso, okay? So you get the idea. So the biggest thing with containers is you want to make sure that any of the objects, no matter what of the, which of these three types you use, no matter um, for any of those objects, you need to make sure that the objects that you want to be contained, that you select them go into that container box and make sure you have return if not contained selected as true. Okay? So that's containers in a nutshell. And as I know, that's an awful lot to take in. And, and I do go through things very quickly um, so we can try and fit in several things over these short sessions that we do. As always, though, I've done my research and there is loads of support available to you on our free user community, Promethean Planet. So if you're not a member, I do suggest you get yourself registered on there. It is free of charge to register. So you just go to www.prometheanplanet.com. On there, under professional development, we've got some fantastic active tips. So there's six active tips that support the use of creating containers. And 68 and 69 are particularly good. They both um, are called Containers Made Easy, and I've shown you that under flip charts below here. Um, and what, what Promethean have actually done is they have created not only flip charts, but also resource packs that have objects with container properties already set. And all you do 
is change the text that, that would be contained in them or change the image that would be contained in them. So they're a really, really great way to learn how to use this fantastic feature of the software. We also have um, loads of really great uh, member-created support resources out there. So other people, other Promethean users who are supporting other teachers in their school to use this technology as well. And I've put a couple of them down here that I, um, in particular, had a look at when creating this session. Um, so if you do a search, keyword search for containers on Promethean Planet and creating Active Inspire flip chart, you'll come up with, with these two ones here and, and they're really useful to have a look at. <clears throat> now, the other thing that I always talk about in these sessions is the Active Inspire user guide. And I'm just going to flip that up for a second here. So this is the Active Inspire user guide here. I'm just going to go to page one. Now, I do warn you, this is several years old, and it's also several versions of Active Inspire old, but it is still relevant and it is still fantastic. Whenever I'm creating one of these webinars, this becomes my Bible for the days that I'm, I'm pulling the content together. So um, I would have a look at the Active Inspire user guide. Now you, you can, I have asked for this to be put on Promethean Planet, but I do know right now that you can get a hold of this user guide by going to prometheankb.com. And if you just do a search for KBM136, and that will call up the Active Inspire user guide. Remember, if you're not writing this down, this is being recorded, um, so you can hear that back later. But what we'll try and do is, is just send out that, um, that, that information in our follow-up email to you as well. Okay, just before I go on, Ella, are there any questions that haven't been answered in the chat? Um, no, I think we've got it covered. I think the most the major problem is some people can hear us and some people can't. Um, right. But I want to say, I want to say, if you if you're trying on, uh, if you're listening to us via your computer, then maybe try the dial in, which you can get from the event info section. Okay, thanks, Ella. That's a shame. People are having difficulty. Okay. So let's go on to our next feature. So the next feature we're going to be looking at tonight is actions to do with the action browser. Now in Active Inspire, you can associate an action with an object. Um, and then that means that the object then becomes an action object. So that when I click on that action object, the associated action happens. So for example, my text in the middle of the page here, actions, when you see I hover over top of it, my icon changes and I get this little play button, this little blue play button. And I set an action to this word so that when I click on it, it moves to the next page. Okay, so there's, there's loads of different actions that are available. The action browser has two tabs. One, and the action browser is over here again, so if you're not sure, hover, but it's that little spinning top. And again, in primary, it appears in the same spot on your browser, and the image looks slightly slightly similar to, similar, similar to that, just a little bit more graphic. Um, so when I go in here, I've got two tabs. I've got drag and drop and current selection actions, okay? There are several hundred actions available in the action browser. And they're organized into five different categories. So if I select, right now you can see my drag and drop, but my current selection is grayed out. So if I select just an object on my page, it now becomes available. And I just want to show you here those categories. So I can look at all of the actions, or I've got the five different categories down here. Command actions, page actions, objects actions, voting, and document and media. Okay? Or, if you want to be really simple, you can just use the drag and drop actions from this tab here. So I'm going to have a look at both of those tabs, and I'm just going to start off with the drag and drop. So drag and drop actions are a selection of ready-made action objects. All you need to do is simply drag them onto the page, and they'll create an object that has an action. So when I now click on that, I now have my pen tool, and I could write on the board. If I drag my little select button on, if I click on that, it now goes back to my select tool. Okay, so these are little drag and drop action objects. So I can put those on my page 
just to make a shortcut. What it also means is that I could just roll that toolbar up out of the way, have less distractions for my students, and just have the tools I want them to use down there at the bottom of my page. Alternatively, alternatively what you can also do is you can drag them onto another object. So if I drag my pen one onto my little image of my pen here, this image now becomes the action object. So once I click it, it actions my pen. Okay. Similarly, if I take my ruler, or sorry, my highlighter, I drag that onto that little image, and when I click it, it now becomes my highlighter. When I click my eraser, it now becomes my eraser. Okay. So I can put these little drag and drop ones here on the page, or I can have an object be that action instead. Okay, so if I want to have my own little images to create actions, I can do that as well. Any action objects that you create can then be saved into your resource library to use again. So we've covered this in other webinars, but just to remind you, I just want to go to My Resources, and I need to select the file I want it to go in, and I'm just going to have it go in this file here. And if I drag that object that I've created into that folder, that's now in my resource library. And the next time I want to use it, when I drag it out, it'll come out with that action attached to it. Okay, so clicking on it gives me my pen tool. So those are the nice little simple ones, my drag and drop. But I am limited to a certain number of them. So I find that actually there's other tools that I would like to make as drag and drop that, that I don't have that here. So that's when I can use a current selection to create my own. So using the current selection tab in the action browser helps you to quickly associate an action with an object. This means that when you or someone else selects the object, the action that you have associated with it will happen. So for example, my little ladybird here, okay? If I um, click on the ladybird, or well, hover, you'll see that I've got that little blue arrow to tell me that there's an action. If I click on it, you can see that my ladybird gets bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? Another one I've done here, the little dog. So this time, I've actioned my dog to walk across the page, okay? So to do this, you want to select the object, and we're just going to go to current selection, okay? So this is the object that I'm working on right now. When I select it, you can see that the action that I chose was position incrementally. And then under my action properties here, the target, so what I wanted to move, was the dog itself. And then I can specify how I want it to move. So I can do this on my X or Y origin. And this time I just wanted it to move along my X, my, my X origin, and I've, I've just moved it in um, 50 pixels is what that means. So it's increments of 50 pixels. Whenever I set it on there, I need to apply the changes, okay? So if I want to get rid of it, I can just remove that. So let's have a look, and I'll put my dog here. This time, I'm going to say position incrementally, but when I click the dog, I actually want the bone to move. So the bone is going to become my target object, okay? And again, I'm just going to say that I want it to move let's say 10 um, pixels at a time. I'm just going to move that over here. So I want that to move 10 pixels at a time. Oh, lost that. Sorry about that. Start again. I wanted my bone a little bit closer. I'm going to change that to 20. Apply changes. And now when I click on the dog, you can see that clicking the dog moves that bone. Okay. I could do things like with text, so um, selecting my text here, and this time I'm going to look for an object action, and the one I'm looking for is extract, so it's all in alphabetical order, and I just want to apply the changes. What I do now is when I hover over top of that sentence, you'll notice I get that little play button, that little action button, and if I click on a word, it makes an exact copy of that, so I can isolate that word to discuss. So I could ask my class in this sentence, which is the noun, which is the verb, which is the adverb? Are there any pronouns? And I can actually get them to click on it 
and take it out just like that. Okay, and that's using extract text. So you can see there's loads of different options as well. My little circle one here, this time maybe I wanted to do a command option. Okay, so I could get it to open a specific website. I could get it to action my pen modifiers. Okay, so I can get it to do lots of different things. And it's just taking the time to have a look through all of these um, that are available. Now, I have put down again the pages in the user guide that cover actions, and there's a really great um, table that talks about all of the different actions in all of the different five categories and gives you a really clear explanation of them and how they can be used. So it is worth having a look at that for sure. Okay. So let's just go and have a quick look at a couple of examples of this. This page uses my favorite action of all, and it's called Hidden. And it's this little um, snap game or pairs or matching, however you want to call it. So students would come up and they would be able to click on it, turn two cards, see if they match. They don't, so hide them again. Somebody else could come up, click two more, keep going until they found the ones that match. So this is using um, an action called Hidden. And the target is just the same object. So all I'm doing is hiding and showing the same object. Okay. I could also use the hidden in, in um, a slightly different way. So with this, I've got little bullet points down the side. And I'm having a discussion with my class. And we're talking about the scientific method. So if I click on um, my first one, I can reveal. So our first step is to ask a question. Second step, third step. So what it means for me as a teacher is I can have all of the information that I want to discuss with my class, but I control when it's shown to my class so I can move the class through the discussion at the same time instead of having learners jump ahead and reading all of the information before I get there. Now, I can do this with other tools that you might be familiar um, with, such as the revealer tool. But what I like about this is I could have other images on the page, so I still give that visual, those visual cues to my students. I don't cover everything up with a big black box, but I can still reveal the information when I want them, um, when I want my class to be able to see it. Okay. This page has used a different action than we've looked at so far. Um, and this is another one that I took from Promethean Planet. And um, what I can do is if I go into design mode, okay, so when I have an action on an object, whenever my snowflake up here is blue in presentation mode, it means if I click that, it's going to action that object. To stop it from doing that, I just go into design mode. And going into design mode, means that I can select the object and edit the properties without it, it, um, without it actioning, without the action happening. Okay, so if I select that, we can see here that this arrow, the um, action has been set to stretch top incrementally. If we look at the target, the target is shape three. So we can see right there what shape three is. And oh, I've taken it off, let's do shape three again. Okay, and it's to um, increase from the top incrementally in the Y axis um, and uh, by 10 pixels as well. So just apply the changes there. Okay, if we look at the little downwards arrow, um, so they changed it and put negative, and this time that means that when I click on that, it'll move back down. Okay, so lots of clever things that you can do with these actions. So once again, um, lots of support out there to help you to, to learn how to use actions and create action objects yourself. So there are three um, relevant active tips available to you on Promethean, Promethean Planet. Again, that's under professional development and um, videos, webinars, and more. And you'll find the active tips here. Um, so there's some really good ones on action objects. There's also some great user-created support materials again, and I've put a couple down here. Doing a search for those names, we'll, we'll call up these flip charts, or you can do a more general search and just put actions in, and that's how I found them as well, but some, some really great support materials. 
an active Inspire user guide again. I've put the, the two pages where you can find them. And as I said, there's a really good one um, that shows, that talks about all the different actions um, and what properties you can set with them as well. Okay, before I move on to the last feature, um, Ella, are there any questions? Hi, um, yes, let me open up, because I've been saving them as a notepad, there's been quite a few. Um, Wendy Clark, um, we're able to access the features on our PCs and laptops, but it simply doesn't work fully on the boards. Are all features um, compatible with other boards? So I think you have a difficulty on, on, a, on not Promethean equipment. Yes, um, it, that's a really good question. Um, and I think that you'll probably find that there are some features that don't work um, completely properly on it. But I would I would need to have more information, such as what type of board and um, you know the the computer that's connected to it. What I would suggest is that you get in touch with the Promethean representative in your area, and they would be able to to um, give you a better idea of the answer to that. Okay, but you got you just to say you're getting a lot of uh, great feedback as well. Um, aid and swords. So many clever techniques to aid teaching and learning. Great activity um, with your containers there for classifying animals into groups of solid, liquids, gases, etc. Thank you, Craig. Um, yeah, and that's about it, really. That's all I have so much so far. Okay, that's that's great. Um, thank you so much. I, I can, as I say, I can see the chat coming in, and I know that there have been some technical issues tonight, um, and also some comments about how quickly I go through things. And I do apologise. But as we always say, the session is recorded, so you will have a chance to look back at things more slowly and try them out yourself. Okay, so let's move on to the last feature today. And this, for this one, we're going to focus on sound and video recorders, okay? So I'm just going to start um, talking, first of all, a little bit about sound. So there are some sound files that um, already come provided in the Active Inspire resources. So if you go up to your resources, or in primary, you would enter your resources from your toolbar. And I want to go to my shared resources, so it's the little double people here, okay, the little multiple people here. And you can see that you've got um, a folder here that says sounds. So in here, there are a variety of sound effects. So for example, I've got uh, a bird sound that I could drag out and put on my page. And when I click it, it then plays that sound. Okay, so it automatically by default comes up with this little um, this sound controller here. But if you don't want the sound controller to come up, you can turn that off just by going up to File, Settings, and um, you want to go to Multimedia, and you just want to deselect the Show Sound Controller. And that will turn that off so that you don't have that sound controller popping up. Okay, I like to have it up there sometimes though, because I can do things like adjust the volume right from the board, or I could pause it if it if it was a longer sound that was being played as well. Okay, the action browser can the action browser that we looked at before would allow me to attach a sound file to an object. So I could go through that select my object, go into my actions, find sound, locate my sound, and do it that way. But there is a, a quite an effective, much simpler way of attaching a sound to an object. And I like to use this when, when my time is a bit limited. So what I can do is take my little icon here, and I'm just going to put this over top of my bird, and I'm just going to stretch it. So I'm just going to use the handles. And then I'm going to make that transparent, OK? Now, if I just dra drag a box around those two objects, I can group them together. And now, if I pick up the bird and move it, the little sound file will go with it. OK, so now it's much nicer for my class, instead of seeing that little sound icon, to just click on an object, and it automatically plays the sound. OK, so that's just a nice, quick way of connecting um, the two, making that action object there. You can also play two different um, types of sounds at one time, and two controllers will be displayed, and they'll show track one and two. So I've just put a little tab down here at the bottom. So track one will play speech or sound files, sound audio files, 
Okay, and that is what's in your little sound library here. Those are the type of sounds we're talking about. Where track two would play more complex audio files, and there's some file formats there. Okay, so if I wanted to play um, a little bit more complex sound on here, I can go into insert, and we're going to go media. And I want to just find my sound file, so I'm going to go to music and sample music. And we're just going to do this one here, made with the flaxen hair. When I click open, you'll see it puts that little sound file on there. So now if I click that sound, I can have my nice music playing. And I can also have my little bird tweeting in the background. And clicking on the little drop down here, I can change the controller for the two different types of sound. Okay, so I could say, oh, let's have the bird one go again. Okay, so I can have two different sounds playing at the same time. So I'll just pull that up to leave that on the screen in case people want to have a closer look at that. Okay. So this is a little example here um, of, of another thing that we can do with sound. Active Inspire allows you to record your own sound onto your flip chart pages. The sound recorder is located in the tools menu. So in studio here on my toolbar, in primary, you'll get um, the, the little hammer and spanner on your toolbar. Your tools will open at the bottom, nice visual tools, slightly different in studio. You would find it under more tools and the sound recorder here. So when I click the sound recorder, I just click record and it starts to record, the, it will start to record the sound. Um, and when I stop it, it's going to uh, ask me to save the file. So I've got a setting changed. But I can save the little sound files on here. And what it'll do is put a little icon like this that I can then play. So this is a little um, lesson that a, a early years teacher was doing and having the children then reading out the sentence um, and it, describing what they had created on the board and having this little sound file here set for it. So as a default, when you use a sound recorder, it will automatically put the sound file on your flip chart page. Now, as you saw, once I recorded my sound, it came up with a dialog box asking me to save it. And that's because I'd gone to File, Settings, and under Recordings, next to this one, Sound Recording, I said that I would want to both add it to the flip chart and save it to disk. Now, the reason why I, I have this changed, I think this was possibly the last webinar that I did that I changed it. Um, is because sometimes I like to have keep those sound files. This is a great way of getting little sound clips that, that can um, act as evidence of learning for my students. So I might want to be able to take that and use that away from my flip chart page. So being able to save it onto a disk or saving it onto my computer means that I could then store that away in a digital portfolio of children's learning as evidence or I could upload it onto our school VLE to share with other learners explaining how to do something. Okay, so um, being able to, to save that to another location means that I can use that file outside of Active Inspire as well. The next page is a more secondary idea of this. And what I love about this one is, is that they, the teacher has used the screen recorder to record a um, them answering a particular problem, okay? And what he wanted his class to do was to put the, the audio back into this. So their job was to watch the video and then record the script that would explain what's happening in that video, okay? And did that just using the sound recorder. So it gave a sound recorder as your hammer and spanner, and in studio it's just more tools and it's the sound recorder here, okay? Now, this teacher also used another feature of Active Inspire that we're just going to look at now, and that's the screen recorder. So to get this little video recording here, um, you just use the software to do it. So it's another fantastic feature available. 
So the screen recorder is just, again, in your tool, more tools, and it's right here underneath the sound recorder. And I can either record the full screen or I can select a specific area. So I'm just going to do um, the full screen right now. Okay, so when I select that, it then comes up with my record toolbar. And I just press the little record button to start my recording, and it's going to ask me to save it. So I'm just going to save it on my desktop. Okay. Now what I can do is I could pick up my pen and I could draw a picture or write an enlightening statement. Okay. So I could record the interaction that I'm having, that I'm making with the flip chart page, or it could be my students could be recording the interaction that they're having with the flip chart page. Once I stop that, it'll then make that recording and then I can press the little play button here just to show you how that will play back. Okay, so just give me a minute while I open that. Now what I could do is I could pick up my pen and I could draw a picture or write an enlightening statement. Okay, so you can see not only has it picked up my interaction with the screen, but also because I have a... Um, I have a microphone on my computer. It also picks up my sound. Okay, so we could have them talking through answering a problem on the board. Okay, or describing something that they're doing. So lots of fantastic ways that the sound recorder can be used. Now, as I said, um, we do have some great sound and video support out there as always. So I've given you some relevant active tips as well as pages in the user guide there. Because of everything we had to cover tonight, I had to cut out at the last minute a couple things on um, inserting video and embedding video into flip charts as well. Um, so again, this is one of the things that Ella and I have talked about picking up as a topic for next turn. So if you do want to find out more about that, keep an eye out for our schedule of webinars um, for the next school term. The other place that you can look, though, is on YouTube. So. Um, as we said, you'll be getting a link to this video, which will go up onto our YouTube channel. And there is a video that's already on there that, that talks about embedding YouTube videos. Um, so you can have a look at that for finding out a little bit more about embedding video as well. Okay, just before we move on to finish up for the afternoon, evening, morning, whatever time of day it is for you, wherever you are, um, are there any questions, Ella, that haven't been answered in the chat? Uh, yes, uh, there are a couple, Janice, just a second. Um, can you export from PowerPoint? That's coming from a couple of people, including Craig Dobson. Can you export to PowerPoint, do you mean? From PowerPoint. So, so Caroline has asked a similar question. Can we insert a PowerPoint presentation on a flip chart without losing sound or movement? Um, I think that the... So you can import PowerPoint into it, um, but I have a feeling that you lose video files and sound files, so you'd need to just insert them into your flip chart separately. And also, if you bring in a PowerPoint into Active Inspire, it won't have all the little animations that PowerPoint has. Um, so it'll, it would drop all the animations, and you'd need to, to um, use the features of Active Inspire to make um, it interactive. Okay, so you could do things like the, the actions hiding um, text and, and just clicking on it to bring it, bring it forward. Okay, um, thank you. Can you preset and store the levels of multiple sounds so that they're pre-mixed for a class? That's quite technical. Um, that one is quite technical. Maybe we could write that down and, and we could right. send yeah. the answer back out to that person. Um, um, just one thing with the, the YouTube. Um, I, no, I haven't tried this yet, or sorry, one question with the, the PowerPoint, I apologize. I haven't tried this yet, so I'll go away and do it because I think that it might work. Um, I know that um, there are uh, slide share, if there's a PowerPoint on slide share, or if I put a PowerPoint in my, um, my OneDrive, I can actually get an embed code for that PowerPoint. And in Active Inspire, you can insert a, a link to a video by using embedded HTML. So in theory, I could embed a, a PowerPoint onto my flip chart page that would then play like a little video. So I could click on it and, and it would move like a regular PowerPoint. 
Now, I haven't tried that, um, but if, if you are a little bit more technical and know about um, embedded HTML and SlideShare, that might be worth, worth something to try. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, can I record my sound to use in reward sound to students? So he's asking. So whether whether you think you can record something while you're in Active Inspire and then use it? Yes. So if I record a sound, you just save that sound file into your resource library, and you can use that again and again on different flip charts. Yep. Or, um, like I said, I could change change that so that my audio gets recorded, um, so I can save it as a file on my computer, and I could use that record that reward sound in other applications as well. Okay. Ivan's apologised about his technical question, but he is also a musician slash musical producer. So uh, no, no, <laughs> no need to apologise at all. As I said, we will we will get back to you with that answer. Uh, there's lots coming in. I think we'll have to get back to people. Okay. You should have um, mentioned embedding YouTube videos. I followed all instructions. Nothing works at all. But like we said, we wanted to put this into this this session, but we just haven't had time to cover. So it will be in a in a following one. Yeah, if, if you do, like I say, when you get to the, the YouTube link, or if you just do a search on YouTube for Janice Pranstadter, you'll come to my channel. And if you click on all the videos, there is one on embedding YouTube videos. Um, and I, I suspect I know what your issue is with it not working. So have a look at that video and see if that answers, answers your problem or corrects your problem. Okay. Okay? Yeah, I think that'll do for now. I'll pass it back over to you, Ella. Thank you very much, everybody, for your time, and I hope that you found it useful.